All right, a beautiful song. Um, thank you for singing that, Janeth. And uh, it was very fitting uh, with the message today. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if that was pl planned to be that way by someone. But uh, if not, it was the Spirit of God that, that impressed you to, uh, to sing that. So very fitting. Uh, praise God. Um, I guess I guess it's to me now. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, good to be with you all again. And uh, I, I couldn't I couldn't be more happy and ready to uh, to be in Philippines. But that's another six weeks away. So for now, enjoy six more weeks here in the United States um, with my family before I leave. And uh, but um, I know some of you are in Korea. Some of you might still be in Philippines, but uh, yeah, um, I posted my Facebook link in the uh, comments in the chat. Um, my name is Obadiah Wright. Uh, I, in the past, I have been called Obi for short, so that's why it says Obi Wright. Uh, but um, anyways, that, if you want to find me on Facebook, feel free to message, reach out to me. I'd love to um, get to know some of you a little bit and... Uh, don't be a stranger. I, I want to, I enjoy engagement and, and any kind of feedback and uh, uh, thoughts that you all have on, on anything from any of the messages. And uh, so I am going to be keeping you all and have been keeping you all in my prayers uh, this week. Uh, thank you for your prayers. And uh, so, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been a, a good week so far. Um, it was a blessing. I got to go uh, to the gym with my dad yesterday to help him he, he has decided that even at 60 years old, he wants to get back and start exercising and start doing some strength and resistance training. So I was helping him out yesterday and it was a blessing uh, to, to give, to, to help him in that. And, uh, and then just this week, just been preparing these messages. So that's, what's been keeping me busy this week. I'm, I'm blessed that I don't have to have work a normal job right now, a nine to five and barely have time in the morning or evening to try and get these messages together or get on here. So uh, praise God for that flexibility right now in, in ministry. Um, but yeah, we'll get to it. Um, I'm going to open up my PowerPoint here and I'll say a prayer for us and we can get into it. Share screen. Uh, let's see. Okay. All right. I think we should be good here. And uh, let's see, let's get the slideshow going. Perfect. All right. Christ's mission to the world, the full revelation of the character of God. And so I will I'll pray and we'll get into it. Loving Father, Lord, it is a blessing. It is a privilege to be your children. It's a blessing to be gathered here together with my, my brothers and sisters from around the world. Oh, Father, it's not the same, not being able to meet them in person, see their face, get to know them in person. But I pray, Father, that uh, that that in time you would open up the way for some of us to be able to meet, whether when I visit the Philippines or if some people ever visit the United States or in heaven. Some of us might not meet till heaven, but I I trust in faith that many and I pray all of the people on this week of prayer would be in the kingdom of heaven that would be, all be sealed at, with, with your name and that we would meet on the sea of glass, that we would be able to share testimonies and rejoice in the love of our heavenly father for his amazing grace and saving us. Oh, the weakest generation, father, we are the weakest generation of all from Adam and Eve. And yet in the weakest, you will show your strength, your might, your grace, most powerfully to glorify your name and to vindicate your character and that you might come and take us home to be with you. So we thank you, Father. Bless us today. May your spirit and your holy angels just be here and touch hearts and speak through me. And we thank you for the precious gift of all dear son, that you emptied all of heaven in the gift of your dear son. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, let's see if I'm going to be able to, hopefully I'll be able to, let's see, go back. Um, I, access the chat. If not, I can maybe see the chat later. Uh, let me see here if I can. Um, so I would like to be able to see what people are commenting, if people have comments while I'm sharing, but um, that's okay. Um, 
I'll figure that out later. Um, so ever since the beginning, the character of God was attacked, even even in it started in heaven, but I'm not going back to to that part yet. Um, but even with Adam and Eve, when 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 the serpent was tempting Eve and he said unto her, you shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. We're not going to get into all the different nuances of this temptation and, and, and all that it meant. But the point here is that uh, Satan was putting us, uh, 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 he, was, he was putting a doubt onto God's character and that God was withholding something from them. Uh, that that he was in some ways selfish and holding back some of the good for him and 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 and, and Satan was trying to offer that that he could offer something that God was withholding from them and uh, this was a lie um, it really opened the floodgates of evil and woe into our world you know people ask questions right why is there suffering why doesn't God do something about it why does good things happen to bad or why does bad things happen to good people as they say why doesn't God destroy Satan? Is God's plan really going to work? Couldn't God have done more? Why does God plague some places but not others? Why does God order to kill sometimes? How do we know when it is a plague from Satan or a plague from God? People ask these questions. Have you asked questions like this before? Have you wondered? Uh, do you have people that you know that are hesitant to want to believe in God? Uh, or, or they say they don't want to believe in God because of certain reasons. Um, Richard Dawkins um, is, a, is a famous uh, evolutionary biologist. Some of you might have heard of him. Um, and he, he grew up Anglican, so he grew up with somewhat of a knowledge of God and the Bible and Christians and whatnot. Um, but uh, this is what he had to say about God. And it's really sad, uh, but, but this, is, this is how he perceives God, and this is how other people probably perceive God. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction jealous and proud of it a petty unjust unforgiving control freak a vindictive bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser a misogynistic homophobic racist infanticidal genocidal felicidal pest pestilential megalomaniacal sadomasochist kappa cushly malevolent bully <laughs> now i don't expect you to to understand all of those worlds, all of those words. And it is really sad, uh, his view and perspective of God. But basically he's saying that God is angry and he's controlling and he's bloodthirsting and he's and he's violent and condemning and uh, bully. Like, oh, it's just, it breaks our, it breaks my heart to think that, that this is how people view God. But, but it's, it's, it's understandable. And, 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 and I take myself, accountable because there are times that i have very misrepresented god's character and uh and and so christians have not done a good job in in in, in representing god's character and a lot of uh, doctrines have misrepresented god um, some people ask the question why do the wicked prosper and the righteous sometimes struggle and and experience want right um wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper right? Uh, they grow, they bring forth fruit, thou art near in their mouth and far from their reins. Why do the wicked prosper, growing old and powerful? They live and see their children grow up and settle down. They enjoy their grandchildren. Their homes are safe from every fear. God does not punish them, or it appears. Their bulls never fail to breed. Their cows bear calves and never miscarry. They let their children frisk about like lambs. Their little ones skip and dance. They sing with tambourine and harp. They celebrate to the sound of the flute. They spend their days in prosperity, then go down to the grave in peace. Now, do they really go down to the grave in peace? No, but it, it, it appears this way to some, and some have this perspective. So they say, well, why, why can't I just live wickedly? If they seem to be fine, like, why, I might as well do that. If, why would I want to be a Christian? Why would I want to follow God if, if, if that means all this extra uh, tribulation and trials and things like that? All right. Why do bad things happen to good people? Um, there's a there's a quote in in uh, Spirit of Prophecy, uh, Ellen White, uh, fourth, fourth Spirit of Prophecy, where she says, the mysterious providence which permits the righteous to suffer persecution at the hand of the wicked has been a cause of great perplexity to many who are weak in faith. 
Some are even ready to cast away their confidence in God because he suffers the basest of men to prosper, while the best and purest are afflicted and tormented by their cruel power. How, it, how it is asked, can one who is just and merciful and who is also infinite in power tolerate such injustice and oppression? This is a question with which we have nothing to do. God has given us sufficient evidence of his love. And we are not to doubt his goodness because we cannot understand the workings of his providence. For us, we might not have these worries. We might not have these concerns, but some do. You might know people who do. And praise God that, that we can, I, I trust that everyone here on this call that has received sufficient evidence of, of God's love, that we have no reason to doubt his goodness because we cannot understand the workings of his providence. But it is a promise to, even if we don't understand right now, just keep trusting God. And in time, God will answer all our questions. It will all make sense one day, if not on this earth in heaven. So hold on, friends. So dark shadow. Um, there's a little thing covering that thing uh, over God removed. Uh, this is from Steps to Christ. You may have read this book. If you haven't read this book, it's an amazing book. <laughs> I've read it many times. God has bound our hearts to him by unnumbered tokens in heaven and in earth. Through the things of nature and the deepest and tenderest earthly ties that human hearts can know, he has sought to reveal himself to us. Yet these but imperfectly represent his love. Though all these evidence have been given. So here's the situation we're in again. The enemy of good blinded the minds of men so that they looked upon God with fear they thought of him as severe and unforgiving. Satan led men to conceive of God as a being whose chief attribute is stern justice. One who is a severe judge, a harsh, exacting creditor. He pictured the creator as a being who is watching with jealous eye to discern the errors and mistakes of men that he may visit judgments upon them. It was to remove this dark shadow by re revealing to the world the infinite love of God that Jesus came to live among men. Isn't that beautiful? That that so we're getting we're starting to get to the punchline here. Why did Jesus come to earth? What was Christ's mission to the world? Was it just to die for us, or was there more that he came to do? More that he came to reveal. The situation we're dealing with. Um I remember doing some canvassing work and uh I, I'm pretty sure some of you have probably done some canvassing literature evangelism and uh, especially anybody who's maybe been to, to Mountain View. I, I think Mountain View College does some canvassing and uh, I did several summers and uh, I was really blessed. It's some of the most difficult work I've ever done, but some of the most rewarding work, very character building and, um, and, and in working for souls you really get to see the beauty of, of souls responding to the truth and be like, wow, you're an answer to my prayers. And I needed these books and, and, and just crying and weeping and praising the Lord that you're at their door. And then you have other people who are slamming in the door in your face or yelling and screaming and cursing at you, sometimes pulling a gun or a weapon on you and saying, get off of their property. I mean, you see it all on canvassing dogs, uh, chasing after you, trying to bite you, things like that. And, but, um, you know, God is good and he protects his children and, and, uh, but I remember this man that I was talking to one time while canvassing and I was presenting him some of the books. I was, uh, I think I pulled out a great controversy and I was talking about the book and the man said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not really interested in your books today. And I said, well, why not? And he said, because, and he started to get really passionate. He's like, you know what? I went to seminary school, not an Adventist school. He went to a Sunday seminary college but he's like i went to seminary school for and he said like two or three years and and even after going to school like at, at a christian college like I, I i i do not interest i'm not interested in subscribing to the god of the bible i have i've thrown the bible out i am not interested in the bible, oh, the, god the, of the, bible. bible. the more the more that i have learned of of god in the bible the more i i just learned that god is this megalomaniac bloodthirsty and he just you know he caused the death of so many people and he's angry and he's this and that and he's like i have i want nothing to do with this god 
And I was just in, I was just, just weeping inside. It started, it started internally. And when I left his presence, I just weep and bawled. I had to fall on the ground and I just began crying. And, 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 and I just felt so sorry for this man that his view of God was so twisted, was so perverted that he want nothing to do with him. And at that point, I didn't have the answers for him. I didn't have the answer. And maybe even if I had answers for him, maybe he would not have been ready to hear them or receive them. But that was a number of years ago. And since then, I've learned some things about God's character that I can genuinely tell that man today that that is not the God that I believe in. That is not the God of the Bible. That is not the God that Jesus revealed. And he is, and, and our God is a God that is love. He is nonviolent. He's non-condemning. He can be trusted. He, he is not responsible for a lot of the things that, that directly responsible for a lot of things that people think he is. And that Satan is actually responsible for a lot of these things. And, um, and, and he has made God look like himself. And we're going to get into that a bit more. But um, I just pray that some of the things that you learn this week will help you in, 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 in giving an answer for your faith. Helping to better understand some of the stories of the Old Testament as you study, as you read. And, uh, and Jesus was that revelation that we needed to truly understand who God was. John 14. You've read this before probably, but we'll read it now. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verse 7. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been so with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying in, in John 8, this is in John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So what was he the light of the world of? Well, how was he the light of the world? Was he showing just, he was showing the path of life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he's the way to the Father. He is the truth of the Father. He is the life of the Father. He's that channel of that 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 life, and and he revealed to us the light of who who God was. He said, "If you've seen me, you've seen the Father." Everything that we see in Christ's life, we can sufficiently say that God the Father is just like Jesus. That's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna read into, study into today. In John 17, 4, Jesus said, I've glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And in, in verse 6, he said, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. So here we say, Christ has glorified his father. He has finished the work that he's given him to do. And he has manifested his name. Now, wait a second. Finish the work. Wait, wait. You're telling me that the Bible is telling us that and I, I asked this question one time. I was like, he finished the work that his father gave him to do. And yet he hadn't gone to the cross yet. Jesus had not died on the cross yet, which he needed to come. He needed to die for us. But wait a second. He finished his work before going to the cross. What was the work that he finished before going to the cross? It was revealing the father's name, revealing the father's character. He had already done that. The cross was, I guess you could say, an exclamation point of the love of God. But it had already been manifested. Here, Jesus tells us the work the Father gave him to do. What is God's glory? Moses asked this question, and God revealed to Moses his glory. In Exodus 33, 18, it says, And he, Moses, said, Please show me your glory. And in Exodus 34, starting in verse 5, he said, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Now, we're not going to break all of this down right now, but this is sufficient to show what the character of the father is. And we can see this in the life of Jesus. If you read the gospels, which I encourage everyone, just saturate yourself as much as often as you can. Get into the gospels, listen to the gospels, read Desire of Ages. If you have not read Desire of Ages, it will change your life. You'll fall more in love with Jesus 
I love that book um, and, and its revelation of Christ. Um, now, this book, Christ's Mission to the World, actually, I think now might be a good time. I can share, let's see, um, in the comments, I want to share in the chat. Um, I'm going to share a link to... Um, I'm going to share a link to some books that I have um, that I've made available for you all. I have uploaded them to my Google Drive. It should be available to everyone. Joy said, I read this book already. I was really blessed. Oh, praise God, Joy. Um, that's awesome. And um, so everyone, if you want to access this book or some other books that are relevant to what I'll be talking about, um, you are free to, it's, it's free to download. There's audio books available on there as well. Uh, so feel free to check those out. I know you'll be blessed. I, I was certainly by these books. And live veiled. So in Exodus 33, and he said, thou cannot see my face for there shall no man see me and live. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. Hmm. Interesting. So first of all, we see that. Moses couldn't see God's face and live. And so God gave him revelation through Christ, um, Jesus. Uh, I believe that's who what who came. Uh, Ellen White says that all communication to earth has, has been through, since the fall, has been through the Son of God, through Jesus Christ. And so um, even, even before the incarnation. So, uh, but uh, that being said, when Moses had that revelation and all the things that had been spoken to him. He had been in the presence of, of the divine. When he came off the mountain, his face was shining. It was so bright that the people could not, they could not stand it. So he had to put a veil over his face. If we go to, um, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't put the Bible reference. I think this is second Corinthians. Um, I could probably, I could figure it out for you all. Uh, but it, uh, it's first i think it's second corinthians um something verse 12 uh therefore since we have such hope we have we use great boldness of speech unlike moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away but their minds were blinded for until this day the same reveal the same veil remains unlifted get this in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. Mm. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is a spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And this is our, 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 our text, Bible text for the week, theme text. But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. So if we were to break this down, all right, so Moses had to put a veil over his face, right, which is symbolic of the people. And you look at even the Jews, the Jews at Christ's day, all right, they, they, when they were reading the Old Testament, there was a, over many people's eyes. And even today it's saying. The same veil remains over people's mind, over their heart in, in reading the Old Testament, in reading the books of Moses. But that veil is taken away in Christ. So Christ was that light. He was the revelation of the Father. He was the revelation. In the road to Emmaus, when the, he was walking with the disciples, he spoke to them. Uh, he revealed himself to them, his disciples in the Old Testament. Christ in the Old Testament. The, the right interpretation, the right understanding. And, and, and the spirit of the Lord, where the spirit of Christ is, there is liberty, there is freedom. And with that spirit working in us, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, the glory as revealed in the life of Jesus, we are transformed in the same image from glory to glory. 
from character to character, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. It's beautiful. And it's it's a mirror here. And we don't have I don't have time to fully get into all the elements of of, of all the principles uh, of God's character. But there is this principle of the mirror. And without getting too technical with it, when we look in a mirror, we either see a revelation of ourselves. Like when you look in a mirror, what do you see? You see yourself. And James says some people look in a mirror and they forget what they look like and they go away and they forget what they what they look like. So a lot of times when we read the Bible, it gives us a revelation of who we are. I mean, we see examples in the in the judges and Samson. And I mean, there's a lot of bad examples in the scripture. Why does God put all the bad stories in the Bible? And the fact that the Bible is written in a way to where it doesn't just say all this good stuff, but it reveals the bad and the ugly. It, it gives even more reason that the Bible is inspired. It's giving us a revelation of ourselves. But the Bible also gives us a revelation of God gives us a revel and, and especially the life of Jesus. That is a mirror in which, as we behold, we become like God in character. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22, Christ's divinity was veiled. So um, having therefore brethren boldness to enter in the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, Christ's flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And this is what Ellen White has to say. Christ clothed his divinity with humanity that human beings might be raised from their degradation and placed on vantage ground. Christ could not have come to this earth with the glory that he had, that he had in the heavenly courts. Sinful human beings could not have borne the sight. So he veiled his divinity with the garb of humanity. That veil of his flesh, he veiled his divinity through his humanity that we might get a glimpse in, into, into the divine. Hebrews 2. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, verse 14, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Are you ready to be free from the fear of death? I mean, as believers, what a blessing to be freed from the fear of death. That we can live fully, our life to the fullest that God has for us to go anywhere that God has us. The safest place for us to go is where the presence of God is. If, if God abides in us and he sends us somewhere within the will of God, that's the safest place we can be. Even if it's one of the most dangerous places on earth, we need not fear death. Where in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brother, that he might be a faith, merciful and faithful high priest on things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And for that he himself has suffered being tempted. He is able to succor them that are tempted. Beautiful promises. Starting to get to some of the quotes from that book, Christ's Mission to the World. Uh, these are some, some beautiful uh, thoughts here. Charmed with the view of his divine perfection. Excuse me, I'm just going to get just a, a little water. The justice and goodness and benevolence that were seen in the character of Christ are to be repeated in the lives of those who accept the privileges of the gospel. That's you. That's me. By study of the word, we are to see him as he is. And charmed with the view of his divine perfection, we are to grow into the same image. The likeness of God is revealed in the perfect character of his son that we may understand what it means to be made in the likeness of the image of God and what we may become if by constantly beholding, we allow ourselves to be changed from glory to glory. Isn't that beautiful? Just allow. The plant does not have to strive to grow. It does not have to strive. Uh, I'm going to grow. It receives the light. It receives the rain. It receives the nutrients from the soil and it grows. It, it beholds the sun. And, and it is, and it grows, it grows. And, and that is all we have to do to behold, to take in the spiritual elements that God has placed around us. All that man needs to know, get this, or can know, 
of God has been revealed in the life and character of his son. Wow. I've had some people tell me, well, no, Jesus only revealed a part of God's character. He'll reveal a different part of God's character later. Or he revealed a different element of God's character before he came to earth. You know, it's, I mean, Sister White here is saying that all that man needs to know or can know of God has been revealed in the life and character of his son. If you if you leave with, with one thing tonight, that that is something you can leave with. Jesus' life per perfectly represented God's character and his law. From Christ's Object Lessons, God requires perfection of his children. And his law is a transcript of his own character. And it is the standard of all character. This infinite standard is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to the kind of people whom God will have to compose his kingdom. The life of Christ on earth was the perfect expression of God's law, which is a reflection of his character. And, and when those who claim to be children of God become Christ-like in character, they will be obedient to God's commandments. It's a relational law. Tender, compassionate, sympathetic, ever considerate of others. Jesus represented the character of God and was constantly engaged in service for God and man. What a be beautiful example we have in him. That's from eight testimonies. So to contrast Satan's work and Christ's work, in Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890, thus, is it, thus it has been, and thus it will be till the end of time. Sin is Satan's attribute, and it is always leagued against good. The spirit of Cain is manifested in all false religions. Satan's work is to condemn and destroy, to take away men's liberty and destroy his life. Transgression always leads men to act as Satan's agents to carry out his purposes against God and righteousness. In Nazareth, Christ announced that his work was to restore and uplift, to bring peace and happiness. He came to this world to represent the Father, and he revealed his divine power by giving life to the dead, by restoring the sick and suffering to soundness and health. He was in this world as the tree of life. You ever wondered what the tree of life is symbolic of? There you go. Satan is at war with Christ, the divine restorer. He is the destroyer. Christ is the restorer. His agents are laid against the Savior's work of elevating and ennobling man. The first death in our world was caused by the working out of Satan's principles. And ever since that time, Christ and his followers have been the object of his malignant hate. So we can see here with this, this compare and contrast, right? We, we clearly see, you know, Satan's work is to condemn, destroy, take away men's liberty, destroy his life. But Christ was to restore, uplift, bring peace and happiness, bring life. And, um, and, and, and this, these are very important principles as we read the scripture and we read something maybe in the old Testament that, that makes God appear as if he's condemning and destroying and taking away man's liberty and destroying his life like wait a second is this really is this really god is this real or, or is this satan and, and sometimes it's written as if it is coming from god but we have to understand that the way that the hebrew bible is in the hebrew mind the bible was written in a way that often what god allows whatever god permits he he takes responsibility for so there are things that that he he is bearing his cross. He is letting people think that he is a certain way. He is working with his people where they were at and, and bringing them to a place where they can love him and trust him more and see his true character. That's why Jesus needed to come to the world, because there was a misunderstanding of God's character. And uh, Satan had made God look like himself. And uh, and so um, this is this is why. This message is so important and why it, it's 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 blessed my life so much because it's helped to read when I read the Old Testament with the lens of the life of Jesus. It helps to, to vindicate God's character and, and give me a better picture of what is actually going on. OK. His work. 
to reveal the Father. Our work, grow in his likeness. And that's just to believe. Jesus said, this is, this is the work, that they might believe in him whom thou hast sent. Satan had so misrepresented the character of God to the world that man stood remote from God. But Christ came to display to the world the Father's attributes, to represent the express image of his person. As the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. This commandment have I received of my Father. The object of Christ's mission to the world was to reveal the Father. There it is. God has left nothing undone that he could do for us. He gave a perfect example of his character and the character of his son and is the work in, of Christ's followers as they behold the incomparable excellency of his life and character to grow in his likeness. As they look unto Jesus, as we look unto Jesus and respond to his love, they will reflect the image of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? We will reflect the image of Christ. Love those who hate us. Do you, do you struggle loving those who hate you? Do you have struggle loving your enemies? We're going to get into this later this week uh, in, the, in the topic, Resist Not Evil, where Christ taught us to turn the, turn the other cheek to love our enemies. He gave us this example. Those who are crucifying him, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, he presented to men that which was exactly contrary to the representations of the enemy in regard to the character of God and sought to impress upon men the paternal love of the father who so loved the world that he, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He urged upon men the necessity of prayer, repentance, confession, and the abandonment of sin he taught them honesty, forbearance, mercy, and compassion, and joining upon them to love not only those who loved them, but those who hated them, who treated them despitefully. In this, he was revealing to them the character of the Father, who is long-suffering, merciful, and gracious, slow to anger, and full of goodness and truth. Those who accepted his teaching were under the guardian care of angels, who were commissioned to strengthen, to enlighten, that the truth might renew and sanctify the soul. These are beautiful quotes. I read these quotes. I just, I cannot get enough of them. It's just so beautiful. The great desire of heaven. Do you think heaven cares about what is going on this earth? Do you think that the angels care? They're all invested in the plan of salvation. And what is their great desire? All heaven is interested in man's salvation. And the work may be done speedily. The kingdom of God may come and the earth be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. The great desire of the heavenly intelligences is that the character of God, so long misrepresented and misinterpreted, may be rightly represented before those who have been deceived by the devices of the enemy. Satan has imputed to God his own attributes. It is not now time that the name of Christ should be great among the heathen? God calls for those who have been enlightened to fall into line and begin aggressive warfare on the strongholds of the evil one. As the Bible has promised, no, uh, the, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. This message is for you. This message is for me. It's for us. And, and, and we are responsible to, to declare God's, to, to show to the heathen, show to the world, what God's character of love is really like. The last message of mercy to go to a dying world is the is a, is a manifestation, a re revelation of God's character of love. So are we misrepresenting God's character? Is the service of God hard and depressing? Have you gotten discouraged sometimes? Have you thought that living for, for God is 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 maybe too difficult sometimes? Is is it is it uh, a sad work? And I pray that if, if, it, if, it, if it has been at times, like the Bible says, be not weary in well-doing, but for you will reap if you faint not. I pray that we all can experience a deeper revival and reformation, that it, living for God would be a joy, that we'd find peace and, and, and great love in, in God's service. When those who profess to be the servants of God draw down their countenances in gloom and are ever complaining, they misrepresent their heavenly father. They are confirming the impression that Satan has made concerning his character. 
They say to the world, the service of God is a hard service. It is bondage to keep the law of God. This is all false. What is it that puts the shackles on men's wrists? Is it obedience to law? No, indeed. Those who keep the laws walk at liberty it is the transgressor that is in bondage. The curse of the law is, upon, is not upon those who are striving to fulfill God's holy precepts through faith in the Redeemer. They are com- covered with his righteousness. They are at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Satan has twisted, he's perverted, misrepresented God and leading men to worship a false God. Satan has wrapped about him garments of angelic brightness and he comes to men as an angel of light. He causes the guilty soul to see things in a perverted way, in a twisted way, so that he hates that which he should love and loves that which he should hate and despise. Do we not see this in our world? People calling evil good and good evil. God is so misrepresented to him that he cares not to retain the the true and living father in his knowledge, but turns to the worship of false gods. He knows not that the love of God is without a parallel, yet Christ has revealed that love to a fallen world. John calls upon the world to behold the wondrous love of God, saying, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knoweth him not. Mm. So this is our situation. This is what the world is dealing with. If you ever wondered, why do people, uh, you know, so hate God in the Bible sometimes? So seeing and accepting the love of God will allow us to turn the other cheek and help our enemies like the Good Samaritan. And we're almost done here. I just have a couple more quotes here. The work of the Good Samaritan represents Christ's mission to the world. Our Savior came to reveal the character of God to represent his love for man. He acted, get this, he acted just as the Father would have done in how many? All emergencies. All emergencies. Christ manifested for us a love that the love of man can never equal. He died to save those who were his enemies. He prayed for his murderers. When we were bruised and dying, he had pity upon us on our dark world. He did not pass us by on the other side and leave us helpless and hopeless to perish. Amen. Hallelujah. Are we so grateful for what are we? Do we have the gratitude, that thankfulness for what our Savior has done for us in coming to our dark world like the great Samaritan to, to help us? But don't forget that quote that the Savior revealed that God's character, that God, just as Jesus revealed to him, would respond to all emergencies just as Jesus responded to all emergencies. And we see in the life of Christ that Christ never harmed anybody. He never did violence to any human being. He never condemned anybody. The woman caught in adultery, he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I don't have time to get into all the implications of this, but may this be a foundation of starting to pray and wrestle and try and understand. It seems like God is responding to emergencies in the old testaments with violence and other things. How do we understand this and reconcile this with the life of Jesus? The great um, physician vindicated. So this is just a little thing on health. As you all know, I'm a big health health guy. And, uh, and so this, this response to the, the topic of health, the great physician cooperates with every effort made in behalf of suffering humanity to give light to the body and life and restoration to the soul. And why is this? Satan came into our world and led men into temptation. With sin came sickness and suffering, for we reap that which we sow. Satan afterwards caused men to charge upon God the suffering, which is but the sure result of the transgression of physical law. God is thus falsely accused and his character misrepresented. He is charged with doing that which Satan himself has done. God would have his people expose this falsehood of the enemy. To them, he has given the light of the gospel of health. Many of you have maybe been learning health principles. You don't have to be a doctor to be a medical missionary. And as his representatives, they are to give the light to others. As they work to relieve suffering humanity, this is practically, right? They are to point out the origin of all suffering and direct the mind to Jesus, the great healer of both soul and body. His heart of sympathy goes out to all earth sufferers, and with everyone who works for their relief, he cooperates. 
And as with his blessing, health returns, the character of God will be vindicated and the lie thrown back upon Satan, its originator. So praise God. This is why it's important to educate people on health, that they can realize that that is because of their violating, breaking the laws of health, that sickness has come upon them. It is not God arbitrarily cursing them um, or punishing them. It, it is a result of the violation of the laws of health. And when they learn how to take care of their body and their mind uh, and they're restored to health, it vindicates God's character. This is from E.G. White, letter 135. We are to observe carefully every lesson Christ has given throughout his life and teaching. He does not destroy. He improves whatever he touches. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. This is wonderful news. Christ improves whatever he touches. And this is the verse I'm going to leave you with, the closing verse. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment or punishment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So thank you all. And uh, this is, I, I'm not going to go over this. Uh, if you want to take a screenshot of this, it's just a, a nice little chart I found that talks about the different names of God, the names of Christ. And um, he's just so many things to us. What a, what a blessing, what a blessed redeemer and savior we have. So that's, that's all that I had to share um, tonight. And I guess maybe I'll have a closing prayer later. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, be silent for now. Thank you all for listening. Amen.